Chicago, the spiritual leader of America's largest archdiocese, the most reverend Samuel A. Stritch, starts his flight to Rome, where 32 new cardinals went to be invested. At LaGuardia Airport, New York, a second transatlantic airliner is ready for Archbishop Francis J. Spellman of New York. The most reverend Thomas Tien, Bishop of Tsingtao, first Chinese ever nominated a cardinal, and Archbishop John J. Glennon of St. Louis. On a plane equipped with radar and the latest scientific improvements, Monsignor Glennon invokes the protection of St. Christopher, patron saint of travelers. 83-year-old Archbishop Glennon is the first to board the plane, named the Star of Rome. Then Archbishop Spellman and Bishop Tien, starting their aerial pilgrimage to the Eternal City. At Killarney's airport, the Cardinals designate set foot on the soil of Era en route to Rome. Premier de Valera welcomes Archbishop Spellman. Then they pose together with Archbishop Glennon and Bishop Tien, and an Irish handshake for China's first cardinal. The Holy City, the churchman's plane circles the Vatican, where they will receive the red hat, symbol of their high station in the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Pius XII, shown here in earlier films, conducts a crowded series of ceremonies, culminating in the public consistory at St. Peter's. With 32 new princes of the church taking their places in the College of Cardinals, this is the greatest consistory since the founding of the Catholic Church. Something new in cars, the hybrid. Fenders from a 1941 model, hood from a 1940 wreck, windshield 1937, instrument board vintage of 1933. The power comes from a motor which first went to work in 1929. The result, Rotzell's idea of modern design. But here's trouble, he can't get it out. Like the fellow who built a boat in his cellar and had to tear the house down to get it out. But there is a way. Take out the shop window and roll the car out. American automobile production will soon make this model obsolete. Guthrie Mitchell of New Jersey invented this one. He thought of it back several months ago during wartime rationing, but it took him time to perfect it. He calls it the wind jammer. No clutch, no differential, no transmission, no drive shaft. Just contact and away it goes. The police gave one look and couldn't decide whether Mitchell needed a driver's or a pilot's license. But here's a real new model car, ready to go into mass production. No, that's not the engine, it's the luggage compartment. The engine is in the rear, a four-cylinder one that conserves gasoline. The top can be removed for fair weather driving, and there's room for it in the luggage compartment if you want to take it with you. In the low-priced field, this welcome little car will travel at 65 miles an hour. and green pastures. Blooded racehorses step proudly over the Australian countryside in the Hunter River Valley, breeding ground of champions. 3,000 foals have been born here, many to grow up into Australia's foremost racehorses. Sires retired from the glories of the sport of kings include native Australian as well as imported English bred champions. Future champion, a newborn foal who tries to get to his long and shaky legs within a few minutes of his birth. Soon he will be big enough to run with his brothers, building muscle and stamina for the day when they face the starter for the first time. <laughs> Veterans of Australia's favorite sport, along with ambitious youngsters who hope someday to prove their own racing prowess, romp over the green pastures of the River Valley.
Northern Ontario's annual winter carnival, featuring the world's most famous children, the Dion Quintuplets, who are making one of their rare public appearances to crown the Carnival Queen of the North. It was May 28, 1934, when news of the birth of the Quintuplets in a Canadian farmhouse electrified the world. Altogether then, they weighed 11 and a half pounds. The girl's first birthday was an event in medical history. Never before had quintuplets survived over one hour. Two years old and doing nicely, their fame by this time had spread to every quarter of the globe. At six, they posed with the late Dr. Defoe, who brought them into the world. Seven years old and a birthday party. It was as hard as ever to tell them apart. Eight years old in 1942. With Canada at war, the girls gave their time to the war bond campaign. And today at North Bay, Ontario, poised and demure in their latest public appearance, they meet some Canadian Indians and see a tribal dance. And that tries on the chief's bonnet. Twelve years old in May, Annette, Emily, Yvonne, Cecile, and Marie are Canada's most renowned citizens. The United States Navy presents the new BTM Mauler, a carrier-based dive bomber. Intermeshing brakes slow down the plane in vertical dives. In level flight, the Mauler is capable of better than 350 miles an hour. At present, it's the Navy's most powerful single-seater dive bomber. Another addition to the Navy air arm is the BT-2D dive bomber. Its 50-foot wings fold down to 24 feet for carrier accommodation. The big engine revs up to 2,500 horsepower at the takeoff. This plane can climb, and climb fast, almost straight up. Performance tests like these prompted the Navy to order them by the hundred to rearm the post-war fleet. Greater retarding effect from these fuselage brakes is ideal for landings on aircraft carriers. This one will speed along 50 miles an hour faster than any wartime predecessor of its type. of the United States Supreme Court speak in behalf of the American Brotherhood Movement. Justice Felix Frankfurter. If one faith can be said to unite a whole nation, surely the ideal that holds us together beyond any other is our belief in the moral worth of the common man, whatever his race or religion. In this faith, America was founded. Chief Justice Harlan F. Stone. Freedom of the mind and the spirit has its practical aspects in everyday life. It includes the right of every man to live and work in peace, to earn and to save, and to enjoy the fruits of his labor, so long as their enjoyment does no harm to his neighbor. It embraces the freedom of all men to speak, to seek the truth wherever it may lead, to think and speak freely, and to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience. 